Cataclysmic Moments The Kamikazes That Saved Japan The Mongol conquests of the 13th century seemed unstoppable, even when thrown up against some of the most powerful armies and defenses on the face of the earth. Europe, the Middle East, and Asia were littered with the corpses of shattered kingdoms. Japan seemed next. Yet what followed would be as miraculous as it was destructive. On the dinner menu. At the time, Japan was in the Kamakura period, an age that saw the rise of the samurai and the establishment of feudalism on the islands. Kameyama reigned as emperor, and his court showed little interest in foreign affairs. At least, until the arrival of Mongol delegations in 1268. The newcomers delivered a message notifying the king of Japan that history shows a small country is to be dependent on a large one. The chilling last line merely stated, King, think on it well. Some advised the emperor to submit, noting that the willow lives long because it bends in the wind. However, the rousing speech of Shiken Tokimune, regent of the shogunate, convinced the council to resist. The Mongol ambassadors were dismissed, and all future delegations forbidden from landing in Japan. This only further incensed Kublai Khan, who ordered the recently subjugated Koreans to construct a grand fleet and furnish great quantities of food, sailors, and troops. By the fall of 1274, the preparations were complete. War had come to Japan. The First Mongol Invasion the first invasion was launched in October from the southeastern coast of Korea. The size of the expeditionary force is disputed. Troop estimates range from 23,000 to 40,000, while the fleet size ranges between 700 to 900 ships. This armada first made its way to Tsushima Island. Here, the governor and a unit of cavalry put up a spirited but ultimately futile defense. The entire garrison was wiped out, and the fleet Next, move on to the island of Iki. Local forces, along with an armed populace, gathered at the governor's castle and fought a desperate last stand. However, Mongol strength once again proved crushing, and the position was stormed. The decisive encounter would occur in November, when the invasion force made its way to the main island of Kyushu. By this time, news of the assault had already reached the Japanese leadership, and troops were mobilized to meet the invaders along the shore. Here, they took up positions along old coastal defenses which had been reinforced with stone and earth bulwarks between 3 to 5 meters in height. It was said that the 30 miles along the Chikuzan coast resembled a huge dragon awaiting the invaders. In all, around 10,000 samurai would make their stand. The Mongols came on. A prolonged fight known as the Battle of Hakata Bay took place over several days as reinforcements from both sides streamed in. The Japanese held the defenses but often sallied out in groups to contest the beach and even fight in the breaking surf. The invaders had difficulty landing large numbers and establishing a beachhead. However, they benefited from superior technology which included gunpowder weapons such as exploding arrows and grenades. At the end of the fourth day, the Mongol commanders decided to pull their main force back onto the fleet. They feared a Japanese counterattack at night on the beaches and wanted to rest up the men for a fresh assault the next day. Despite these precautions, the Japanese nonetheless managed to attack, not by land, but by sea, with a small fleet of tiny ships, each holding a dozen warriors. They assaulted the anchored vessels and set several alight. This wound bloodied the Mongol force, but was not fatal. That blow would be struck by Mother Nature. A fierce wind confronted the Mongols, raising great waves that battered the coast. Japanese sailors were able to find shelter for their small ships, but the large Mongol vessels were not so lucky. In the dark, the terrible storm took its deadly toll. By dawn, the fleet was severely crippled. Hundreds of ships were said to be damaged, beyond repair, or sunk entirely, and around 15,000 men drowned in the waves. The remaining vessels limped back to Korea, with Japanese forces hot on their tail. The Second Mongol Invasion The failed invasion of Japan was but a temporary setback. The Mongol Empire could easily absorb material losses of this magnitude, but psychological damages were far more threatening. The Khan's strength rested on the appearance of invincibility, and this had to be restored. Seven years later, the wrath of Kublai would be unleashed. The stakes were even higher this time around. 
the Mongols had finally defeated the Southern Song Dynasty and could turn their full attention to the planned invasion. In fact, an entire governmental department was created, known as the Ministry for Conquering Japan. Meanwhile, Japanese leaders were busy organizing for the anticipated second assault. They executed Mongol ambassadors, hunted down spies, and built up a strong line of fortifications along anticipated landing sites. The stage was set for a monumental showdown in 1281. Two massive fleets would sweep down on Japan. Records claim that the first left from Korea with 900 ships and 40,000 soldiers, while the second left from China with 3,500 ships and 100,000 men. However, the sheer size of the armadas made their actions clumsy and difficult to coordinate. The northern fleet arrived first and began its actions along the Kyushu coast. Some Japanese engaged them at sea, but the bulk of their forces sought to hold the defensive line along the shore. The second battle of Hakata Bay had begun. Fighting went on for several days, but the staunch resistance of the samurai prevented the Mongols from once again gaining a permanent beachhead. And yet, the overwhelming numbers of the southern fleet, however late in their arrival, would be enough to tip the balance. The brave defenders could not hold out much longer. It is at this point that once again the winds returned. A typhoon of appalling ferocity and intensity tore through the Japanese coastline. This was shocking to both sides, as storms of this nature were not expected until later in the year. Caring little for human expectations, nature's fury fell upon the massed Mongolian fleet. Archaeological findings have suggested that the damage was so overwhelming because many of the ships were not of proper seafaring design, owing to the rush construction of the armada to meet the invasion timetable. Overburdened boats were dashed on cliffs, impaled on rocks, and disgorged on beaches. Records indicate that 4,000 ships were lost along with 70,000 men. Such was the totality of the cataclysm and the density of bodies that it was said one could walk across the sea. What remained of the shattered Mongol fleet slunk home while substantial numbers of survivors, including Fleet Admiral Chang Shi, were left behind to be destroyed piecemeal by the samurai. Safe from invasion. Though a third invasion was planned, it never came to fruition. The burdens of raising yet another land and sea force placed too great a strain on the Khan's subjects in China and Korea. These were utterly drained of manpower and resources, having also had to contribute to invasions aimed at Vietnam, Burma, Java, Sakhalin, and Champa. Ultimately, other matters consumed Kublai's time, and the threat hanging over Japan was lifted. The two Mongol invasions would be deeply influential to the Japanese. They learned much from their military contact with the advanced Mongol forces, and even developed the famed katana as a consequence of their experiences. Great national pride grew from victory, and it roused the people's martial spirit. Legends would immortalize those who fought gloriously, but in time, these were subverted by the story that divine winds, the kamikazes, called down by the emperor himself, had saved Japan from invaders. During the Second World War, the Divine Winds would once again be called upon. This time, it would be pilots, known as kamikazes, who would strike from the sky to repel naval forces from the inviolable sacred islands. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.